So, you want to know what in the world is a Presbyterian? Well, grab a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage, stick around, and you'll find out. Hi, I'm John Judson, and I want to welcome you to this series of videos on what in the world is a Presbyterian. To put it simply, Presbyterians are people, Christians, who believe certain things and govern themselves in certain ways. In this video, we are going to talk more about what Presbyterians believe, and we're going to do so through what is called the Presbyterian Church USA Book of Confessions. Before I tell you what is a book of confessions or what's in the book of confessions, I want to tell you why we have a book of confessions. I believe that there are two critical questions that Christians have always asked themselves and that I think we ought to continue asking ourselves. These questions are, what do we believe and what ought we to do? Many of you may say, well, John, just read the Bible or just do what Jesus would do. Those are both fine as far as they go, but the scriptures are filled with history and poetry and stories and apocalyptic literature and prophetic works. And so how do you cohesively bring all that together into answering the two questions of what ought I to believe and what ought I to do? Similarly, people say, well, just what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, and many of the issues with which we deal are not issues with which he dealt. And so again, how do we answer the question? The Book of Confessions is intended to help us answer those two questions. What ought we to believe and what ought we to do? It helps us make sense out of the scriptures. It helps us make sense out of what Jesus said and Jesus did. So, a couple of, several, three things, actually, about the book of Confessions. First, confessions are subordinate to scripture. In other words, you have scripture, then you have the book of Confessions, then you have the Book of Order. So, all of what we're going to talk about is subordinate to Scripture. Second thing is, all of these, everything in the Book of Confessions is historically rooted and grounded. All the pieces in here came out of moments of crisis in the life of the church when the church was struggling with what ought we to believe and what ought we to do. Finally, what's in the Book of Confessions, and again, we'll talk about this in just a second, is their guides. Think about them as a, as a uh, boundary on a, on a football field or a soccer pitch. That as long as you're within the bounds, you can do just about anything you want. You can make up plays, you can pass the ball, you, you can do any number of things. Uh, but when you're out of bounds, you can't play. Play stops. The Book of Confessions is intended to be the, the boundary in which we as Presbyterians, we as Reformed Christians, play the game of faith. It's the bounds of saying, here's what we ought to believe and here's what we ought to do. So, what is in this thing called the Book of Confessions? First, there are two creeds. And the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, meaning I believe. These two creeds are the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. There are five confessions. And confessions, in this sense, is not confessing our sins. Confessions means that we confess or profess what we believe. These are the Scots Confession, the Second Helvetic Confession, the Westminster Confession, the Confession of 1967, and the Belhar Confession. There are three catechisms. 
catechisms are ways of answering the questions, what ought we to believe and what ought we to do, in a question and answer format. These are the Heidelberg Catechism and the Westminster Longer and Shorter Catechisms. There is one theological declaration, that's the Declaration of Barman, and one brief statement of faith. Now that we know what's in the Book of Confessions, or at least the pieces of the Book of Confessions, let's talk about each of these individually. We'll begin with the creed that most of us know or with which we are most familiar, and that is the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed went through many iterations, uh, beginning probably in the 200s, um, someplace going into the 5 to 700s, but the crisis out of which the Apostles' Creed came was what ought a Christian to profess they believe and what ought they to believe to be baptized? If you remember, early in the life of Christianity, people were coming out of Roman religions and becoming Christians. The question was, what should they believe? And so the Apostles' Creed was created as a Trinitarian formulation. Remember, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian formulation, and it has been used now for almost 2,000 years, and so you may be familiar with it. Uh, when there's a baptism in your church, the whole congregation is asked to stand and reaffirm what they believe by using the Apostles' Creed, a baptismal formulation. The second creed is the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed comes out of the early 300s, and a note, the Nicene Creed that we possess is not the original Nicene Creed. It has been added to, adjusted a couple of times. But the original Nicene Creed came out of the early 300s after Constantine had unified the Roman Empire. Not only had Constantine unified the Roman Empire, Constantine made Christianity legal and ultimately made it the religion of the Roman Empire. What this meant was that bishops and theologians could finally publicly begin arguing with one another about a wide variety of, of things, what people should believe and what they should do. But one of the areas of greatest debate was over the nature of Jesus. Was Jesus fully human? Was Jesus fully divine? Was Jesus sort of human, sort of divine? And they argued about it a lot. And that would have been okay, except what began to happen is that bishops began to excommunicate the bishops with which they disagreed, with whom they disagreed. And what that meant was that they excommunicated the people in the area over which that bishop had jurisdiction. And so trade began to bog down because you couldn't trade with someone who wasn't a Christian, who had been excommunicated. Constantine was not going to have any of that. And so he called together the bishops from across the empire to the city of, yes, you guessed it, Nicaea. And there he said, you're not leaving here until you get all this worked out. And so out of that crisis came the Nicene Creed. And, and there are two critical pieces that we need to remember out of this creed. The first is what's called the dual nature of Jesus. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. You are not supposed to confuse these two things to say Jesus is sort of one and sort of the other. But neither can you separate them and say Jesus is only one and only the other. It is that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. What Nicaea also did was that it said that the Spirit was God and thus was born the Trinitarian formulation. And so those two things, the dual, natures of, dual nature of Jesus and the Trinity, have become the marks of what it means to be an orthodox Christian. Orthodox meaning playing within the boundaries of what most of us call orthodox Christianity. At this point in the Book of Confessions, it moves from these two very early creeds to reformed and more modern, though many of the reformed confessions and catechisms and creeds are not modern, but they are reformed. And before we take a look at these, I want to remind us of the hallmarks of what it means to be Reformed. 
And so here we go. First, it means to believe in the sovereignty of God. God is in charge. Second, it means to believe in God's freedom. God is free to do what God wants to do when God wants to do it. We can't control God. Third is God's providence. God has a plan for creation, and God is going to work this plan out. God's election. It's God who chooses us. We don't choose God. God's covenants. God makes and keeps promises. Our stewardship, that, that we've been called not just for salvation, but for service. We are to be stewards of creation, stewards of our neighbors, uh, stewards of the gifts that we have been given. We are to use them wisely and well. Our obedience to God through Scripture is the next to last of these marks. That being a follower of Jesus is, is not just about believing something, it is about doing something, living in a particular way, being obedient to God. Finally, sin is real. Sin is a brokenness in humanity. You can think about it as breaking God's laws, as wandering off God's path, as missing the mark. But in any case, sin is real. Sin distorts our understanding of who we are, what we ought to believe, and what we ought to do. And so somehow, God has to deal with it. So now, with those marks of the Reformed tradition taken care of, let's move on to these um, confessions, catechisms, creed statements. Scott's Confession. In 1560, Scotland won its independence from England. And so the question was, the burning question, was what ought we to believe now that we are free from the Church of England, now that we are free from the Roman Catholic Church, what is it that we ought to believe? Well, the Scottish Parliament brought together six people led by John Knox and said to them, write a confession. And so in four days, they wrote the Scots Confession. The Scots Confession has four sections with a total of 25 chapters, but it's divided into four sections. These sections are, and see if this sounds familiar, the first section, God the Father. Second section, God the Son. Third section, God the Spirit. Fourth section is about the church, uh, the church and its sacraments, the church and its polity, how ought the church to organize itself. Because it was written in just four days, this confession is not as complete and thorough as others. And yet, if you want just a, a brief look at what the early Reformed tradition looked like, I encourage you to take the time to read it. We now turn to the first of our catechisms. The first catechism is the Heidelberg Catechism. The burning question here was, how could a ruler teach his people about the Reformed tradition when the Reformed tradition was illegal? Let me explain. The year is 1555. The Lutherans and the Roman Catholics in Europe have signed a peace treaty, the Treaty of Augsburg. And this stopped wars that had killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. What the treaty said was that the ruler of each nation could choose which religion uh, their people would follow. They could choose Roman Catholicism, or they could choose Lutheranism. If you notice, something's missing here. And what's missing is the Reformed tradition. The Reformed uh, churches got left out of the Peace of Augsburg. But the ruler of a small nation called Palatine, which is now in Germany, named Elector Frederick III, had become enamored with the Reformed tradition, even though he'd grown up Roman Catholic. And so he wanted to teach this tradition to his people. So he went to the University of Heidelberg and said, uh, listen, I'll pay you if you all create a catechism that can be used in the churches in Palatine. So the theologians and biblical scholars at the University of Heidelberg wrote the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, a reminder, catechism is simply a question and answer form. 
of question and answer form of teaching what we ought to believe and what we ought to do. This catechism was divided into three main sections. First, the, the misery of man, <laughs> or sin. Second, the redemption of man, the work of Jesus Christ to redeem humanity. And finally, the gratitude of man, what we ought to do in response to what Jesus has, had done. These three sections were divided into a total of 52 units, if you will, one for each Sunday of the year. Each of those units would then have three questions, and these questions would have answers. And so through preaching and teaching on the three questions on each Sunday, by the end of the year, people would know the Reformed tradition. So that's the Heidelberg Catechism. The next piece in our Book of Confessions has to do with the Second Helvetic Confession. This also has to do with Elector Frederick III. Well, as you can imagine, there were people who were not appreciative of the Heidelberg Catechism. They saw it for what it was. It was teaching the Reformed tradition. And so they decided to put Elector Frederick III on trial. And so the burning question was whether he would burn. Elector Frederick III knew he needed someone to help in his defense. And so he wrote to this man named Heinrich Bullinger. Bullinger was a pastor and reformed theologian. And when Bullinger got the letter, he remembered something that he had been working on in the past, that he had actually been working on writing a confession, and it was for his own personal devotional life. And he had written it and used it and simply stuck it in a drawer. And so when he got this letter from Elector Frederick III, he pulled out the confession, uh, made some careful edits, sent it to Elector Frederick III's trial, and Elector Frederick III was vindicated. He was declared to be not guilty. Now, you may wonder, how is it that a Reformed confession could do that for him? Well, one, the, this confession was really moderate in tone. It wasn't stridently Reformed. Two, it was more universal in outlook. What ought all Christians to believe and do? Third, it was related to Christian experience. So in some ways, moving away from the specifics of the Reformed tradition, it talked about how Christians ought to live. And it was not adamantly reformed, but was sort of reformed. And it paid special attention to worship, ministry, and marriage. And so the people said, well, yeah, this is sort of reformed, but you're off the hook. So that's the second Helvetic Confession. Next, we come to the Queen of Confessions, the Westminster Confession. The burning confession here was, what ought the Puritans to believe now that they had won their independence from the English, from the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church during the English Civil War. Many of you may not be familiar with the fact that, that England had its own civil war from 1642 to 1649, where they overthrew the monarchy and they actually executed the king. And Parliament asked itself, well, okay, if we are now freed from the Church of England and from the Roman Catholic Church, what should we believe? So they got together a group of men uh, called the Westminster Divines, and over a three-year period, they wrote this thoroughgoing confession, and not only this confession, but the Westminster Shorter and Longer Catechisms. Those are our other two catechisms. And what they do is they essentially boil down what's in the confession to a series of questions and answers. But Westminster was overtly reformed. It focuses on the sovereignty of God. God is in charge, not just sort of, but God is completely, fully, absolutely in charge. Nothing happens without God's direct involvement. Second, the scriptures are critical. Sola Scriptura, scripture alone is the rule of faith and life. Scripture teaches us all we need to know for salvation. 
predestination. God chooses some for salvation and some for hell. Next, God alone is Lord of the conscience. Ultimately, what we believe is between ourselves and God. And then it talked about everything from civil government to marriage to the sacraments. Um, and this confession is used by almost all Presbyterians. In fact, many Presbyterian churches do not have a book of confessions. They simply have the Westminster Confession and its shorter and longer catechisms. That's why we call it the Queen of Confessions. Next, we jump into more modern times. We come to the theological declaration of Barman. The critical issue here was to whom should allegiance be given by Christians. This, the Barman was written during the rise of National Socialism, the Nazi party in Germany prior to World War II. As National Socialism became uh, the governing authority in Germany, it also began to be the governing authority in the church. That the National Socialist Church essentially said that one gives one's final and ultimate allegiance to the state and not to Christ. But a number of Reformed theologians living in Germany got together and they wrote the Theological Declaration of Barman. And essentially what it says is that first, last, and always, our allegiance is to God in Jesus Christ. That no state, no person can claim that allegiance over ours to God. It's a fascinating and short um, piece of Reformed work, and I encourage you to read it. Next is the Confession of 1967. The Confession of 1967 comes out of the upheaval in the United States during that period of time. Uh, rioting and disagreements over the war in Vietnam, rioting uh, and uprisings um, in our inner cities. And the question was, could, how do we get beyond this? How do we, how do we get beyond this? How do we deal with, with this tearing, of, tearing apart of society? And so what the Confession of 67 deals with is reconciliation. It too has three parts. First, God's work of reconciliation, how God is at work reconciling humanity to God. Second, our ministry of reconciliation. If God's out there reconciling, maybe we should be as well. Third, the final and great reconciliation of all the world in the kingdom of God. Again, I would really encourage you to read this because we live in a time in which reconciliation is needed, and that's the key to this Confession of 1967. Next is a brief statement of faith. The brief statement of faith was written in 1983 with the reunion of the Northern and Southern Presbyterian churches. And, and these two churches had divided over slavery and the Civil War. So it had taken from about 1860 to 1983 for these churches to come back together. And so they believed in that moment they needed to make a unified statement about what they believed. And it is a brief statement. Again, it is Trinitarian in nature, and it focuses on what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the future. The last of our confessions is the bell heart confession. The burning issue here was not in the United States, but in South Africa. As apartheid ended and the nation had to unify itself, the question was, how do we do that? How do we reconcile across these horrific issues of race and pain and oppression and death? And so again, it talks about two things. It talks about reconciliation and justice. It makes clear that without justice, reconciliation cannot occur. And so it says that unity, true unity of all God's people is both a gift that God gives and it's an obligation we are to undertake. Also, again, it calls for reconciliation and justice to walk hand in hand. Now you know a bit more about our Book of Confessions. You can find it online uh, at the PCUSA uh, store. 
uh, get yourself a copy, read these, and learn about the boundaries of our Reformed tradition. I hope on this day you find something to be grateful for and give thanks to God, and then get out and enjoy some of God's good creation. And may God's blessings be on you now and always.